Okay, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Killian Riano. Uh, we have uh, folks still coming in, uh, but we're gonna get started and, we, and people just catch up to us. Um, uh, so it's my great pleasure to introduce, uh, to welcome you to this session. Uh, we are very excited to share with you all that we have done uh, in Dark Matter University over the last year. Uh, uh, Dark Matter University really began around July last year and it has been um, a, a productive one, we hope, and we have some uh, thoughts, ideas, uh, projects, ways of working to share with you and also questions to ask, questions about our process, our way of working and ways of moving forward. So thank you so much. Uh, it's been great to get a great, re great response to Dark Matter University, both within and outside of the institutions. Uh, and I think that, that's, uh, that, that means that, uh, that we are on to something and we're, uh, and we're hoping to have that conversation with you today. Uh, and we are a BIPOC-led effort that grew out of uh, some of the work that the Sinus Protest was doing, uh, specifically their, their demand number nine which asks us to redesign our architectural design and build environment fields of education. Uh, so, one second. So the, you're here, the, if you're, this is the, the wrong event, the, you're at, at, our, at the ACS of, ACSA event. And, and we're here both uh, sharing with you some things that we are learning and also, uh, again, asking questions and having this conversation alongside with you. This is going to be the, the, the way that we're, the days and the night is going to run. Uh, we're gonna start with this welcome, go over the event overview, which we're doing now. Uh, Vanessa is gonna describe a little bit about the Sinus protest, then I'll come back and talk a little bit more about Dark Matter University. And Taya is also going to describe the way that Dark, Dark Matter University has been working over the last year and how we hope to continue to work. Then we're going to go right into the course types. So far, we have four major types that we're going to be presenting to you. One are seminar modules, and we have uh, one in the very first one that was taught at Tuskegee University. Uh, then a, a large effort that includes multiple universities, uh, a course called Foundations of Design Justice. Then we're going to move to some studio modules. Uh, there were two of them taught at Carleton University then some seminars, power tools and fugitive practices, and then some DMU roster and affiliated courses. So these, this is broadly speaking, some of the courses that DMU takes a part of, and these are some specific examples that we can bring to you and have a conversation about. And then we're hoping to, uh, Jennifer Newsom is gonna talk a little bit about ways to engage with DMU, and we're hoping to leave as much time as possible for your, uh, to, to have a conversation. Uh, so without further ado, Vanessa. Thank you. Thank you, Killian. Um, so we're really excited to be here today. And many of us are part of the Dark Matter University network, um, but we're also part of the Design is Protest Collective. Um, and there is a, a form there to get involved if you want, and we'll pop it in the chat. But there's also a national call that's happening on June 5th that's celebrating the one year anniversary of the Designers Protest Collective, which is, is a collective of anti-racist designers that are dedicated to design justice in the built environment. And as Killian said, this is um, uh, Dark Matter University is partially um, a response to one of the design justice demands, um, which is really looking at um, how to, to rethink our, our architectural um, education. Um, so if you can go to the next slide. Um, so the Designers Protest Collective has a series of different working groups. Um, some of them are pictured here. Um, there's a planning and policy, data and research, direct action, field organizing, and within field organizing, they're looking at youth, student organizing, academic organizing and practice. Um, and they also have a storytelling um, effort. Now this, this um, they're really, really active and I encourage you to join on the national call if you're interested in getting more involved. And I'll turn it over back to Killian now. And so I'm gonna describe a little bit. Dark Matter University began in the summer of 2020 in the immediate aftermath of the murder of George Floyd at the hands of state violence. Uh, and the, uh, uh, while these existing organizing efforts and demands amplified and served as a space of convergence for BIPOC designers, academics, and professionals, all of whom had been having conversations in their own spaces around systematic issues of pipelines into the profession academia and academic institutions in particular. 
in this mix, several different constituencies of people joined into, uh, into brainstorm this effort and what would become Dark Matter University, including existing members of design uh, as protests and a loose network of BIPOC academics and professionals, some of them holding existing built environment academic positions at universities around the country. We began to see the opportunity for uh, invention within the intersectionality, uh, specifically in the context of the COVID pandemic, distance learning and the uh, Black Lives Matters protests critique of our institutions. Since all of us were now talking in the same digital space, perhaps we could leverage this newly crystallized network into a new model of institution that could use the space of Zoom, for instance, in new and creative ways to allow BIPOC voices to have more agency and autonomy to generate new anti-racist models of instruction and collaborative knowledge production that can rethink some of the pathways into the profession but simultaneously help to reimagine the practice itself. Uh, our vision is very clear that we cannot survive and thrive without immediate change towards an anti-racist model of design education and practice. Existing systems have not been able to transform away from centering and advancing whiteness through the reliance on an implied dominant and racialized subject and audience. The impacts of that centering are widespread and can be felt in the inequities that global, extra, uh, that global extraction, racial capitalism and colonialism have created. For us, it was very important. Uh, and one thing to note is that both this vision and mission took a long time, a big collective effort to write up. And the idea of subjectivity and the democratic uh, ideals that that, 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 that uh, idea holds it was important for us to think about. And to think about when people think about an architect, what they think about, and they think about, about an architecture professor, an architecture student, and how we can begin to reimagine that very subject. Um, the vision further says, one second. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm gonna move on to the mission. A dark Matter University is a democratic network with the following principles guiding its actions. We work to create new forms of knowledge and knowledge production, new forms of institutions of power, new forms of, coll of collectivity and practice, new forms of community and culture, and new forms of design. And I'll turn it over to Ty. Thanks, Killian. So Killian and Vanessa just kind of outlined how we came to be, right? But it's a really large group of people. So at this point, we have close to 140 people in our network, uh, which we at Dark Matter call our roster. Um, and this is a myriad of professionals across academia and practice um, that are looking to kind of align with the goals and the vision that Killian just said. And um, how do you get a group like that to sort of work in, you know, concert with one another? Well, that is where the space of the last year in the pandemic and working virtually was really beneficial um, because it allowed us to be able to come together in an online environment. So if we seem really organized and we seem really large to all of you, it's because we've been meeting like twice a week for almost a year now, you know, looking back and reflecting on the events that sort of kickstarted this, we're exactly a year out from that in this um, upcoming week. And uh, we were able to come together and organize around four core areas. Uh, we call it core, which is sort of, you know, the closest thing we have right now to a board or a really central uh, organizing group. Um, we have the advisory and the support team, which are individuals that were interested and committed to the mission, but could not support as much time. This is also a space where we have allies in that space. Um, and we break into kind of four key groups, right? There's people, which is really working at, uh, you know, we, we affectionately call them HR internally, um, but they're kind of dealing with who could be interested in joining and how do we link people to opportunities within our group. Uh, we have content. Content is really our largest committee. Um, and there's a lot of things that are happening on the content team. And content's dealing at any point, anything from what's the content for a lecture, like this lecture that we're working on that we were here to night. The content's also working on things dealing with our social media and our website platforms. Content's also brainstorming new uh, education engagements and uh, courses that we might be teaching in the future or workshopping through ways that we might 
better deliver assignments in the, in the current time. Um, and they're also working on what we like to effectually call campus, which is sort of this virtual third space that we've created where practitioners, students of DMU related coursework can come together and convene and discuss things um, in a space, a shared space and shared environment. Um, we will share more information about our Dark Matter University and our overview for you to read. And we are diverse. Um, you know, there's 140 people in this collective, most of whom are BIPOC educators. So for all of you on this call tonight that may be deans or administration at schools, we've long heard schools saying the people don't exist or they can't find them. Well, here's a list. You could just start right with this list right here. There's a lot of people and there's really great uh, practitioners that are really committed to this work. And uh, it's been a pleasure to work with this group of individuals over the last year. I can't even begin to tell you how rich it's been for me professionally. And because we know that the built environment engages so many different types of designers, we went wide, right? We know that to change the world and to really do something different with our built and our design spaces, we've really got to talk to designers of all different walks of life. And so we have many different fields, backgrounds, um, professions, uh, degrees that are covered across all sorts of institutions. And it's one of the things that both allows us to be interdisciplinary in our approach, but it also allows us to continue to learn and continue to push ourselves to think differently about how we might deliver, create, and incept um, things that we're working on, which is something that is important to us and authentic to the, both our mission and our values and the way that we operate. And so this is kind of a big network that shows all of the things that we have going on. Um, and there's lots of ideas that have come out of this group about urbanism, about the way that we deliver things, about collective work, about labor, about design um, foundations, about pedagogy and practice. So uh, if there's a thing that you think you might be interested in that intersects anywhere along the idea of race identity and how we educate, assume that it's somewhere in this network because I know the teeny tiny font is really hard for you <laughs> to read. And so there's lots of space for more people to get involved and there's lots of ways to engage. And also right now, like I said, we have 141 people across 24 states. So we're really covering a wide swath of both in the United States, but also institutions. Uh, we've also had some outreach to folks internationally. That is something we're hoping that we can be able to grow into in the next year. Um, we have taught what we're calling 14 network roster courses. You're gonna hear a little bit more about the courses later, but network roster courses are courses from members of our collective that are taught independently, but because of their own personal research or practice are tied in somehow to one of the themes or one of the ideas that we've been kind of working on. Um, and so we are really excited about sharing with you some more of the things that we've done this year um, so that you guys can learn more about how we've been operating and how you can get involved. One of the best things about what we do is the interconnectivity. Um, this is just a chart showing you just a handful of people, like there's 10 people on the slide and showing all the ways that just working in this space together this year, we've been able to tie in. So, um, you know, what starts as one studio becomes a partnership, a way for folks to work on another project at another institution, informs a course that's, you know, at three other institutions and allows for both full-time professors and people who aren't even teaching yet. We've had some students in the space. We've had some recent graduates in the space that were able to both contribute to content as well as syllabus creation for courses that we have. And it allows you to really enrich that environment uh, because we're able to do everything collectively as a group um, and really take the best of everybody's brains um, to really deliver the best content ever. This is a snapshot of some of the products that we use to advertise courses and opportunities that we had this year. Um, the best way to kind of keep up with sort of our, our digital visual spaces is through our Instagram feed. One thing that we piloted this year, which was really exciting, was we did video syllabi for courses, um, which was something that both students, when we were in kind of a remote world, uh, were really gravitating towards and it allowed us to do something and reconceptualize how do you framework a course and let students know and engage them around content um, so that it doesn't feel like a contract or a legal document. Great. And so, Thank yeah, go ahead. Just, about to say gonna, Justin, yeah. tell you more about the courses. Great. Thank you, Taya. Um, and echo everything everyone said that it's, it's really been incredible to get to do this work uh, together and in community. Uh, so now that you kind of have the background and, and structure, 
uh, we really wanted to do work that followed that vision and mission that was laid out. And one of the first ways that we did that was to work together to create new relationships and ways of working across different types of institutions and learning communities. Uh, so the pandemic and the call for addressing social and racial justice created new opportunities. Uh, so new formats, online learning, working across institutions, uh, et cetera. So we created individual courses, lectures, and workshops that were really seen as modules uh, as a way to collaborate with universities, but also with each other outside of the very traditional model of a single faculty member teaching a single course at a single institution. This modular approach allowed us to create new curriculum and content that was missing from design and built environment education. And so by engaging with these different types of institutions, we were able to work to more intentionally and explicitly integrate design justice focused thinking and curriculum and ideas uh, while developing new spaces and opportunities and ways of learning. Uh, and in some cases, this led to completely new coursework. Uh, and in some cases, this was to supplement uh, existing courses. Uh, next slide, please. And so our uh, very first course uh, was, and, and collective effort was to work with uh, Tuskegee University. So this is what we call DMU at Tuskegee. Uh, for the ARCH 100 uh, Careers in Architecture and Construction class. Uh, so we worked with Rod Fluker uh, and the faculty there at Tuskegee to develop a model where a broad uh, diversity of architecture and design approaches and careers uh, could be introduced to uh, freshman year Tuskegee students and using our sort of what we call our roster, our broad network of faculty from across the country uh, in DMU, and by design, uh, working with Tuskegee alumni. And so we had uh, multiple faculty teaching one course as an introduction uh, to the students. And so this was a way to, to kind of rethink and readapt an existing course, uh, but really providing a way for students who are beginning their design education to have a much broader variety and diversity of understanding uh, for design, but also an opportunity to discuss uh, really some of the important and challenging conversations around equity, social justice, even environmentalism and design. Um, next slide. So I'll take over for this one. Um, so there were five of us who were co-teaching this course. Um, it was Justin as the anchor professor, um, and then uh, Killian Riano, um, Jennifer Newsom, uh, Jer Jer J Jerome Hayford and, and myself. Um, and each, each of us sort of shared our career paths with the students in different ways. And these are some screenshots of the presentation, but it was interesting because when we were selecting the people to teach this course, we wanted to make sure that we had different career paths and we all did. Um, and we all actually sat in on the courses with each other. And so it was actually quite fascinating to see um, the, the circles and where we all had connections and we all got to learn about each other's career paths. And I, I have a screenshot here of, you know, Jennifer's presentation and she opened up with asking the students, and these are first year students, like, what is your er earliest spatial memory and what does black space mean to you? And it was really just an, a, an amazing way of opening up a conversation with, with these students and it really created a, a, an amazing dialogue. Um, so I just wanted to share that. The Lectures are actually um, available on YouTube if you're interested. And so some of the kind of reflections of, of, about the course were, um, you know, some of them were sort of logistical, right? Like it was really, really important that we had um, Professor Fluker as a kind of our anchor host faculty um, at Tuskegee, and then also having Justin as the kind of like core anchor faculty from DMU, um, just to have kind of consistency between um, from course to course, because there were the five of us teaching as well as um, alumni from, from Tuskegee. Uh, I think in future, you know, we're really interested in thinking about how do we have more collaborative workshops really between the DMU instructors and the, and the host alumni, um, you know, just to kind of further that relationship building. But I think one of the most significant things for us is really um, changing the notion of what is a required course. 
uh, you know, thinking about uh, that it's required to have diverse perspectives on design, that it's required to have, um, you know, a variety of people, people with different backgrounds, with different voices, with different trajectories, and expose students to that very, very early on in their careers. I mean, I think we were so excited to teach the classes. We we're like, oh, it would be amazing if we had had this class when we were first year students. Um, and just, you know, kind of getting yourself into that really projective space of how I get from here to there. Um, so this was, you know, just kind of a summary of some of our reflections about, about this class. Thanks so much, Jennifer. And I just wanted to uh, chime in to say that you can expect this at the end of each of the courses that we're going to be presenting. Uh, each of the groups has developed a series of takeaways, uh, questions and, and thoughts for, uh, for future projects and future ideas, even potentially questions for, the, for you. Uh, so just wanted to mention that. Andrew is next. The usual mute drama. Thank you, Killian. Uh, Andrew Chin, Florida a &M. Listen, while numerous ACSA programs of classes that address issues of housing, culture, and power, the DMU seminars engage these classes a little differently. The differences are captured in the DMU Foundation of Design Justice class. In the next seven minutes, we'll highlight the unique characteristics of the DMU academic experience. And next slide. The current slide summarizes the most recent sites for the foundation classes. The DMU difference begins with the design of the classes, specifically the syllabus, the composition of students, the university partnerships, the leadership of BIPOC faculty, BIPOC content, and the unique BIPOC guest speakers. The list on the left shows how the foundation classes really provide an opportunity for students to hear from new voices. Um, there are five, oh, this is AL. Um, uh, one of the co-anchors of the Foundations of Design Justice class. Um, there were five modules to the seminar and this is kind of how they relate to one another. Module one introduces students to design justice, the big picture, how design has inherent biases and is culpable to systemic oppression. Students reflected on how their identity has shaped their approach to design. In module two, uh, community work and power building. Students learned how to critically consider the limits of their role as architects in community engagement processes. And they also explored power building in co-designing the built environment with community. Module three, infrastructure and neighborhood takes a systems thinking approach to examine how historical patterns of injustice shape our collective memory and signal who is valued, who belongs and who does not. Uh, module four, housing, looks at how discriminatory and exploitative planning policies have affected housing design within architecture through topics such as redlining, restrictive covenants, and predatory lending. And module five, workforce and economic development, explores traditional and community-based models of economic development to examine how systemic patterns of labor and capital show up in urban systems, placekeeping, architecture, and design. Next slide. I'm B is one of the co-anchors as well. And as Andrew mentioned, one of the unique strengths of our foundations course is the collective course development process, which directly embodies our mission to create new forms of knowledge production, collectivity, and community. Collective course development began actually late last summer with non-hierarchical brainstorming sessions led by the content working group that drew upon our BIPOC networks, lived experiences, professional expertise, and academic insights. In the fall, all three working groups, content, opportunities, and people coordinated our university partnerships, the staffing of DMU co-facilitators and guest lecturers, and a focus group of several dozen co-authors who pushed through months of long but joyous Sunday meetings to organize themes, subject areas, and learning goals into the resulting syllabus. The winter spring 2021 syllabus itself continued to be collectively developed as a live document that has been regularly coordinated between all of the co-facilitators uh, from DMU across the schools, as well as supplemented with resources shared by students and guest lecturers. And all told, the course has been a labor of love touched uh, by a critical mass of BIPOC educators and practitioners and a new model of collective course development. Next slide, please. Hi, uh, my name is Lisa Henry. I am one of the co-authors and university partners for this course. Um, 
one of the really unique aspects of these courses is that we're they're designed to be taught in a cross institutional setting. So, um, for example, University of Utah and Florida AMU University came together into a single classroom with a set of facilitators, and this led to specific issues and specific questions that we had to deal with as a group. Um, one is the distinct student bodies and experiences, very different settings. You can see from the publicity photos from FAMU and University of Utah, very different student bodies with different experiences in terms of the curriculums that they've had, in terms of the experiences they've had with the issues at hand. Um, another um, issue that comes up repeatedly is distinct institutional cultures, whether it's curriculum mapping from the two different institutions and how this course might fit into that curriculum. Um, grading requirements, um, institutional grading requirements and scheduling requirements, all of these create um, uh, obstacles or opportunities for uh, really creative and flexible leadership. Me and Andrew were both university partners for this course and it was really critical that we got together um, with a will to make change, with a desire to, to see these courses succeed. And we had to think about how we were gonna deal with the cross institutional culture and bring together um, a totally different kind of teaching, a totally different kind of community in which students really have the opportunity to take advantage of their different experiences and their different perspectives to learn from the, each other and to collectively create knowledge um, in the context of a course. Next slide, please. Thank you, Director Lisa Henry. Um, so my name is Jati, AKA Big Tropic Boy. Uh, so also a part of the uniqueness of DMU's course, specifically in Foundation of Design Justice, is that all our guest speakers in part of creating this content um, were BIPOC. And you can see in this diagram here, uh, created by ABs, uh, a lot of the, the ranges in professions um, can be from tenured professors, as such as uh, Dr. Shahin Rudberry, as well as um, practitioners as Brian Lee, um, Steely Jr. Um, in addition to that, uh, we were team teaching. So for instance, my experiences, uh, ha having just graduated last year, uh, young blood kind of thing paired up with someone who's more uh, seasoned in terms of teaching has been really helpful in terms of being a co-facilitator in this space. Um, in addition to that, we can see that there's a lot of uh, partnerships and co-authors and um, including those who aren't part of the necessarily in-depth day-to-day, or not day-to-day -day perhaps, but week, week to week, um, such as um, current students like Anne, um, who came in as guest lecturers to kind of speak towards what are the, the contents and the narratives of anti-racist design justice. So um, that's kind of how we operate it in our foundation design justice. I'm happy to include more people as the circle grows and the dinner table increases in fees. So uh, next slide. Um, so this seminar was as much about the content as it was about the learning community in order for the messages about design justice in the built environment to reach students they had to feel safe enough to be vulnerable and open to new ideas. Students have to be in a place to learn and to connect. And there was connection um, between students and students, students and guest lecturers, despite the setting of the virtual classroom. Community agreements were the shared foundation that relationships grew out of. Each seminar of students had the opportunity to freely and openly discuss what they wanted in the classroom and what they didn't want in the classroom and came to an agreement on respecting each other's boundaries. And this was helpful during difficult conversations and tense moments. The community agreements grounded the conversation in reality and real time feelings. Next slide. So my, my name is Tonya and uh, I wanted to share some of the challenges that we experienced um, and the lessons that we learned that ultimately led to more questions, um, which we kind of wanted to put out there for all of us here and also um, in the audience to reflect on together. And so the first lesson or challenge really came from our FAMU students. They expressed to us that they found it frustrating to be carrying the conversation or speaking up more than their white or even uh, non-Black POC peers, and that they often felt tokenized as the Black students in the class. Um, and this was amplified by the subject matter, you know, which heavily focused on issues pertaining to Black communities, to addressing white, uh, white supremacy, to addressing anti-Blackness. And in that context, their lived experience was really seen by their peers as an expertise, right, as it should be. 
Um, but anyone you know with any marginalized identity knows what it's like to have a topic come up uh, that relates to your particular identity and to have everyone kind of look towards you to speak you know, on behalf of all people of that identity, right? It's incredibly awkward. Um, and at the same time, I think some of the other students uh, might have felt uncomfortable speaking up about issues that were new to them. Um, and I think a lot of them were really also just sort of practicing, you know, not taking up too much space. And so the lesson um, or challenge was really that the students, you know, especially in this kind of, you know, resourced, under-resourced, cross-institutional setting are all coming to the same space with a different identity, with a different lived experience, with a different background. And those differences lead to um, different forms of vulnerability. And so how do we spend um, more time understanding those vulnerabilities? Is this class ultimately about building trust and empathy um, and not about, you know, all of the modules, the infrastructure, neighborhood, housing, workforce, economic development, right? Is it more just about kind of creating a common understanding, um, being in community, and is that the kind of foundation of design justice that we want the students to take away with them coming out of this class? Um, and the second lesson or challenge was that collaborative work and collective authorship takes time, right? It takes time to coordinate um, schedules, to listen to diverse points of views, to accommodate and work across differences in experience, in age, in background, um, and time zones. And, um, but it's also more enriching. So, you know, we've really kind of created this support system with opportunities for lateral mentorship and intergenerational learning. And so I think the question is, you know, how do we continue to make time for the benefits of this process? And how can we, you know, compensate ourselves and other educators who are advocating for these kind of slower, more time intensive, you know, intergenerational collective reflexive practices? And how do we, you know, sustain ourselves moving forward so that we don't burn out and resort to kind of the more individualistic, you know, efficient, um, you know, non-relational modes of working. Next slide. Hi everyone, I'm Chat Travieso, also one of the co-anchors. Um, so teaching virtually uh, opened up new possibilities for us, uh, such as cross-institutional collaborations from different cities, having multiple co-anchors in different time zones, bringing in guest speakers from all over the country and collaborating in new and exciting ways using virtual co-creation platforms. However, as many of you uh, might've experienced yourselves, uh, online learning has also brought into sharp relief long-standing inequities such as who has stable internet connect connection, who has access to software and computer that can support it, uh, who has a dedicated and undisturbed uh, workspace. Uh, so some of the questions we've been asking ourselves around this uh, include, you know, how do we even the playing field uh, within this context? How might uh, foundations of design justice work in a post uh, Zoom world, or is it only a remote remote course? Uh, and how might uh, normalizing virtual delivery cultivate broader engagement with diverse participants, instructors, and communities? Um, also, uh, we believe uh, learning should not be punitive, uh, and we based our grading on engagement with the material and commitment to the work, prioritizing learning, growing, risk-taking and experimenting over perfection and production. Uh, but this also brings up some questions on uh, how can we encourage administrators and leadership in schools to deprioritize grading? Uh, maybe this course should only be pass-fail or even no grades at all. Um, but uh, you know, in a system in which students have been conditioned to see grades or the risk of getting a bad grade as an incentive, um, how do we deprioritize grades while still sustaining engagement and holding students accountable? Uh, next slide, please. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's me again. Uh, the next course type that we're going to talk about, sorry, my, my computer's having a little bit of freak out. Okay. Uh, we're going to talk now about a few uh, studio modules. So uh, Carleton University I approached us uh, uh, at the, around the fall and was asking if anyone would be willing to work on this. And one of the things that we decided to do, and this was part of the larger content team, and many of the folks here were a part of this, uh, was to make a call uh, for potential courses that people within the DMU collective were interested in, in teaching. Uh, uh, Jalisa uh, Bloomberg and Curry Hackett came together and created a, a, some, a, a studio, a way of working, something they wanted to explore, uh, called For With, which they're going to describe in one second. And then uh, uh, Jan Lowe and myself uh, submitted uh, course ideas were around uh, cooperatives, collectives, uh, a new ways of working. So this was so we then uh, put out the call. 
who would like to teach this studio? Uh, then, uh, you know, Jalisa and, and Curry were ready. They, they had something, they had some ideas. And then uh, Jen and I we talked about it and we decided to work together. Uh, and then the four of us, Jalisa, Curry, Jen and I, started chatting about potential sites, about potential places. I share with them uh, some of the work that I'm doing here in Cleveland, Ohio, where I am located right now. Uh, and that I was very much interested in, in, in working with a set of stakeholders that I have been making relationships with for a long time, uh, who are doing some amazing work in a previously in a red line community, uh, disinvested, uh, that, that is really, uh, that there's some incredible things going on called Huff. And, um, and so we decided to cite our studios in the same place they work together and collectively and begin to move forward uh, in, in sharing, uh, is, uh, creating a, a network, an ecosystem of support for our two modules. And I'll go and let Good evening, everyone. This is Curry Hackett from Howard University. Um, let's speak to you a little bit uh, with Jalisa um, about our studio for with an individual practice towards collective expression. Um, this is the first of the two modules, as Killian mentioned. Um, and just to get into a bit of the subject matter, uh, we were, were really interested in the prevalence and the phenomena of Black culture um, across the, the sort of context of the Americas and, and what that tells us about possibilities, about imagination, um, about the human condition. Uh, and so it was also important that we looked at this from multiple lenses. So looking at the Black body uh, and the gathering of Black bodies as a kind of conduit for cultural expression uh, we're sort of putting on the table, how can we situate Black existence as a viable alternative to uh, Euro-American modes of living? Um, and so we conducted a series of improvisational exercises, uh, which were kind of this gradient from individual to collective effort, uh, which, which uh, took cues from cultural methods uh, from the African diaspora to deter disproportionate individual uh, contributions and ego, uh, while encouraging response, collective responses, uh, which foment uh, in turn, permit uh, collective voices and celebrate interpersonal exchange. Um, next, um, I'm Jalisa. I'm, I'm in I'm in Brooklyn right now. Um, yeah. So our our I think we should go to the next slide, Killian. What happened there? There we go. Back, back one. So we we looked. There we go. Um, we our first our first project uh, was looking at. Um, we curated a set of Black American cultural artifacts that individually offered something novel to consider about expression and, and collectivity. Um, we asked students to study one of the artifacts and de develop diagrams, notational devices, and scripts. Um, yeah, so we we were really looking. We took we took some time to to collect these, but we're just going to just touch on these three right now and to describe the range that we were looking at. On the left, we had we were looking at you know how HBCU marching bands are as a sort of like. They're, they sort of represent a type of collective expression, you know, how a whole band can move and express with sound and gesture as one body. Um, in the middle is um, the slab scene in Houston, how um, expression can be extended through the mechanism of a car, um, in, this, in this case, a, mod a modified car subculture. Um, and, and also in that, in that uh, reference, we were also interested in, in the historical context of African Americans and their relationship to automob automobiles and leisure. Um, and lastly, on the right um, is Drexkia, which is an electronic duo from Detroit. Um, and that one had us, it was a little bit more obscure, but it was interesting because we were curious about uh, how, what it means to render oneself not invisible, but obscured from the gaze of others. Um, and so we're going to move to just through some of the projects now. Uh, yeah, so this project uh, looked at uh, one of the artifacts, Double Dutch, um, as a kind of uh, a way of re reprogramming of the street and the sidewalk um, into a sort of theater or a stage, right? So then what does it mean for these young Black women to reclaim public space in this way? Uh, and we're kind of putting in the onto the table uh, that this might be considered as a kind of refusal uh, of maybe domesticity as the kind of proverbial dominant mode of expression for Black women. Um, the student, uh, Lorraine, offered a, a clinical sort of study of this artifact, uh, mapping emotions and, and momentum over time as one enters and exits the implied space uh, between the two ropes. Uh, she also carefully mapped the, the fragile relationship between the jumper and the turner uh, and the consequences of that relationship on time and on space. Next, next slide. Are you on the next slide? It should be. Oh, sorry, maybe it's slagging on my side. There we go. 
Um, yeah, so this artifact is a home recorded video of the screwed up click in, from Houston, Texas, um, freestyling in DJ Screw's home. Um, the screwed up click, most notably the late DJ Screw, are known for their chopped and screwed sound and its prominent contribution to Southern rap. Um, in this diagram, Anthony studied, uh, the student Anthony studied the penning gaze of the camera across the room, along with timestamps, lyrics, and YouTube comments. Um, he also carefully cited each member in the video and the YouTube commentators. Uh, in dialogue, we discuss what it meant to be allowed into the privacy of DJ Screw's home um, through this video, and uh, along with that, like the intimacy of their creative process, what it means to be able to be allowed in, and how, and and the the scope of being like. Uh, the way that they're they're allowing us into this this space. Next, uh, this one was about go-go. This is the regional genre in DC, which synthesizes uh, rock and funk, gospel, trap, uh, reggae, and others. Um, it has a, a dance that is typically uh, performed to this called beating your feet, uh, which maintains a sort of um, profound, uh, really, uh, relationship with the ground plane. Uh, with the performer using their feet to kind of stimulate a, a frictionless surface. Uh, so Alia uh, charted these movements through time, uh, developing her own notational system uh, to chart implied space as the different performers entered and exited the communal space. Um, we, uh, we also appreciated her use of citations uh, in this project and, and the naming of these performers in a diagramming uh, uh, as our position is sort of that while these performers may be uh, less concerned with single authorship, uh, the naming and the recognition of these kinds of artifacts are super valuable um, in the broader discussions of canon and precedent. And here, um, here we're looking at voguing. Christina studied voguing uh, with through a video of Derek and Randy Mugler at the Mizrahi Ball in Harlem in 1997. I wasn't I wasn't there for that, but it seems fascinating. Um, what was important here was considering intersectionality, and um, I'm sure a lot of you know about voguing. But here we're thinking about like the intersectionality of of, um, of black culture with uh, queer communities. And in this case, it'd be black and brown queer communities in New York and specifically Har Harlem, um, transforming ballroom floors into hybrid realities, you know, performing, embodying, becoming, and existing across a multiplicity of narratives through gesture and dance. Um, Christina uh, created a notational system for the, the various gestures and dance movements and the relationship between their, um, their arms and legs and their bodies to the ground and, and map these out rigorously across the, across the, the ballroom floor that she has drawn here. Um, and she also cited um, them as well. So yeah, it is, there's so much more here. It's super, super intriguing, but we're gonna, we're gonna keep it moving. Um, here, uh, we asked, next we asked the students to um, map Huff Cleveland and um, they spent just a week and a half. It was very rapid, but we had community organizers, uh, thanks to Fillion, who brought community organizers into our classroom um, from Huff, and the students mapped uh, their findings across the spectrum, um, the, axis, the axes being um, qualitative versus quantitative data and uh, micro versus macro scale. Here's the quantitative map uh, along a, at a macro scale um, overlaying redlining, including digital red, redlining across Cleveland. Uh, so the studio ultimately concluded with um, those uh, three groups, uh, sort of um, each of four students, each synthesizing the findings from the previous few weeks. Um, so through the lenses of, of care, connectivity, uh, and community, we presented uh, these sets of provocations as these fully playable games. Uh, so cited, each of these games were cited in Huff, uh, in Huff Cleveland, in each approach interrogated ways of designing a streetscape that uh, allowed for unknowns and a multiplicity of futures. Um, so in lieu of this sort of traditional architecture review, right, uh, these groups facilitated a, a wide range of, of guests. Some of them were actually from, from Huff, uh, again, thanks to, Cleveland, uh, to, to Killian. Um, and we, we went through these interactive sort of design approaches um, within the neighborhood of Huff. And you can conclude with uh, the next one, Killian. Um, yeah, and it's just here, just thinking about network of communities. I think that was the most important thing for our studio was thinking about how we're always in community. Um, we're never looking at a community as outside. So um, yeah, that's, that's, that concludes our, our module to pass it off to Killian and Jen. So hi everyone, I'm gonna share a little bit the next one, uh, which is uh, related uh, to, to the first one around collectivity issues, but 
There's a couple of things. Number one, uh, Cleveland ha is becoming known for uh, the cooperative projects that are happening around here. The Evergreen Cooperatives and the Health Anchor Network, the Democracy Collaborative, have been doing incredible work uh, reimagining uh, the, the economic sphere, the, turning it more democratically, and they're hoping to turn that more into a civic sphere that is more democratic. This is specifically within the African American communities that surround the Cleveland Clinic, one of the most, the biggest and most profitable uh, institutions in the country. Uh, yet uh, that doesn't get reflected in the communities that surround it. Um, uh, it, this studio, uh, at the same time as we, we were uh, running this module, I was teaching a similar studio at Kent State University. Uh, and we, and again, we were able to work with Cleveland Owns, a radical cooperative uh, incubator, third space, doing some amazing work here in Cleveland around uh, racial equity, and 12 Literary Arts that is organizing youth groups to, re, uh, to do urban planning of health and to work together with these groups, uh, understanding closely. The, this is the community of Huff between Cleveland and the, uh, uh, the downtown Cleveland and the Cleveland Clinic and Case Western area. Uh, and the important thing for us was to think about what collectivity means co and, and create a process that, uh, that begins to talk about that. We started with the body and we started with the body very specifically. So the students were grounded on the people of Huff. Not bringing in, uh, they did research into six different sectors. And out of those sectors, the arts, landscapes, et cetera, they chose one person that they were, uh, that, uh, that could be their composite or real person that they, they had studied and uh, to begin to design for. They began to design for them at the level of a furniture piece. It moved to a unit where two or three bodies could be in the one place and then all the way to a building landscape or piece of infrastructure. At each one of the steps, the students had to negotiate. Two sets of students would, would uh, work with each other, show each other their work, and then uh, create a, a negotiation diagram around, uh, and through that diagram, create a mutation, change their work by working with that other team. So at the end of the semester, all everyone's work had, the, they weren't the same, but they had DNA from each of those projects, creating new possibilities. So here you see the body, you see the structure that began to design, how that unit grew. And then in here, there are some explanations about that very uh, uh, idea around negotiation. Jen? Thanks, Killian. Hi, everyone. This is Jen from Washington, DC. Um, so as Killian mentioned, we had 12 students. They worked in groups of two. So we had a total of six project proposals on six different systems in the Huff neighborhood. Community organizing and activism, care and support, transportation, landscape, arts, and urban farming. Next slide. To highlight a couple of uh, projects from our studio, the first is the Urban Tutu by Minette Murphy and Thompson Wynn. Um, central actor in their design investigations um, is Lexi Lattimore, who was a community leader, organizer, and also a dancer and performer. Next slide. Minette and Thompson integrate all the facets of Lexi's um, uh, various roles as, as a community leader um, and also um, arts and cultural activists too to motivate their cooperative system that amplifies and grows existing community organizing, activism, arts and cultural infrastructure that already existed in Huff or already exists in Huff. Next slide. And these products were really a process into how to embed interventions that connect to existing people, processes, and infrastructure. Next slide. Um, Alice Wan and Yakin Zarad also proposed an arts community land trust through a series of arts-based live work campuses. This is a snapshot of their actors network diagram that really drove their programming um, of the inside and outside of their proposed structures. And they developed inside a collection of three systems that really celebrate and set the stage for the commons. So a live work artist residency, an exhibition performance park, and a food market and urban farming campus. And then Eric Goldstein and Anique Wheeler proposed a transportation cooperative that manifests into a system of transit and mobility oriented sharing economies and series of porch like public commons throughout. 
And we also really appreciated their early process that include a series of spatial and time-based journey maps of existing transportation networks as part of their design process, really mapping existing systems that are through the lens of neighborhood actors. And so we'll conclude sort of our, our reflections um, sort of in three sort of key themes. Um, one is uh, the grounding and language and narrative. Um, how, what, our, what we say, what our language matters. And that sort of runs across sort of our visual representations, how we write, how we sort of orate and narrate places, our projects are really sort of really key in being specific about that. And also unpacking how are we defining community? What com communities are we representing, speaking to, adding specificity to this? And also research rigor and what constitute research in this spaces? Whose voices are heard and who are we sort of speaking to and referring to and rooting sort of our interventions um, back to existing sort of contexts? And next we were also, we the four of us also reflected on tools and processes and um, first being that the emphasis on process as an outcome was really fruitful over just focusing on final product and deliverables. Um, we also thought that slowing down just feels revolutionary. I think um, it's something that we've all learned in the last year. Uh, third, uh, the role of the architect and designer, I think it was something that came up a lot, is how do we think about designer as facilitator, um, both in pedagogy and in practice. Um, and lastly, citations, you know, how do we cite our work in an academic space? Um, are traditional citation formats enough? Um, how do we give credit to, to so many folks who are underrepresented um, for their contributions to culture and knowledge sharing? The, the last uh, question uh, that we had is around sequencing. How do, how to make studios more kind of call collective and cooperative in nature? There's a, there was both the two modules and there was also the Kent State University studio uh, and the Carlton studio in Canada. Uh, so one of the things that we're wondering is can more studios begin to have different modules that are connected but have different ideas and different people working on similar yet very different uh, uh, sets of, of work that then all together can create one cohesive session. Uh, I can share with you that I've never in my life taught uh, uh, similar studios at the same time in two places. Uh, one short, six weeks, one long, 15 weeks. And one of the things that was fascinating that became almost a practice and we could work together and learn something and then tell the other students. And we think that this might be working better here. Uh, and, and then we, got, we had big events in which we brought community stakeholders uh, alongside and had the students from Carlton and Kent having conversations with each other and talking about their projects and giving each other scripts. That was probably one of the most powerful educational experiences I have experienced. Uh, and, and the last thing I'll say, which is not here, which is one thing that we kept asking is uh, the question of who gets to design for whom is something that kept coming up, uh, something that we had to work through with students, some students. Uh, and the idea that we that is not about who gets to design for who, but a process that is thoughtful, rich, and rigorous that allows for uh, to work uh, in, in communities. Thank you. So next, we'll just look at um, an example of a DMU seminar. Um, go to the next slide. Um, Lexi, Shannon, and I both, who's also in DMU, we taught um, a seminar called Power Tools at GSAP in, at Columbia, um, which came about because we were talking about a course catalog for DMU and just discussing the need for counter canonical resources. And, and we started looking at the whole earth catalog and we're, and we're, we're having these conversations about how, how that is such an interesting uh, kind of collection of self-reliant tools, but it lacks so much. And there was this kind of, uh, with hippie modernism and utopia, and the, the utopia there's a, their ideas of utopia, there was a kind of willful ignorance towards civil rights movements. And so it, it just brought up this idea about tools and how we, how we think about tools and, and the relationships to power. Uh, if you go to the next slide, um, so we started with diagramming, diagramming power actually in Miro and on the right is just a, a one clip of uh, some of our collective diagramming with the students of, of readings. Um, and the next slide, and so you'll see the Miro board was really like, it existed on, it kind of scaled up over the semester in a fascinating way, like powers of 10, but it also sort of felt like, um, it sort of reminded us that like power does exist at these various scales. It's, it can be very micro, very, very large scale and very, very short scale. Um, the so I'm just gonna go through some of these projects. Um, 
I we sort of grouped them. I'm gonna put the link to the website here if y'all are interested in more. We're gonna have to zoom through these. Um, but here was just a set of these were taxonomies and catalogs. Um, next. Here are tools of mutual aid and essential needs. Next. Here are tools of printed matter. Um, next. These tools are, we called them tools of fugitivity, um, which were super interesting. On the right, this student actually was in Beijing the whole semester and did her, her project around um, um, local, lo like the kind of resistance of local uh, coffee shops in Beijing against Starbucks and the kind of cultures, subcultures that exist there. And on the left, looking at um, underground tunnels in, at Columbia's campus. Um, next, here are tools of, of language. Um, and the last one, if we go next. The last one is, is we, we called this meta tools and these students all looked at tools that organize the tools of the rest of the class. And so um, on the left was a power tool shed. It was the idea of co-opting the, the typical New York City newsstand. Um, on the bottom was this idea of like, what does it mean to like create a uniform, a counter uniform um, to, to typical civic uniforms? Um, and here we have, um, you know, our website that I've linked here, and we also got to print risographs of, of some of the work, and that's all up at on campus. And really, I think I spoke with Lexi last night, and we were talking about how some of the main things that came up was that we really felt over the over the semester that students really wanted this type of material. They consistently, they 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 continually told us they they continuously told us this, um, and that they will rise to the occasion when the when the opportunity arises. Um, also that like there's um, there's something really energizing about creating a space where students are able to feed off of each other's work. So thank you. Jerome? Oh, I, I, I didn't know this was my slide. Hi, everyone. Um, so the next kind of course type that was developed um, uh, uh, um, here at DMU really was this idea of kind of bringing different um, groups of students together and sort of agitating the lines uh, that sort of divide institutions. So this kind of DMU cross-listed course was really sort of spearheaded by Justin Moore, if we go to the next slide, with a couple courses in the fall um, that he worked to devise between uh, um, sort of historically resourced institutions, Columbia and Yale, and then um, two uh, historically Black colleges, Tuskegee for difference in design and then Morgan State for urban differencing change. And so it's really um, uh, this fascinating way that we began to think about how the teaching of this content really almost sort of also uh, questions the container of, of, of knowledge and knowledge production. Uh, and so um, another one of those cross-listed courses uh, that um, uh, Curry Hackett and myself worked on, we will now sort of present to you guys that was uh, that we just are just wrapping up now. Um, and so uh, my uh, I teach uh, here in New York at Columbia and City College. I'm an architect and urban designer, but I was approached to teach a seminar with Yale University, my alma mater, and um, um, it became a collaboration with Curry, who's who has already introduced himself. You there, Curry? I'm here. Um, and Kurt, we, we, you know, uh, we we met in the context of the early formation of DMU around this shared interest in sort of Black and Indigenous history and modes of cultural production and how those might inform um, design and pedagogy. So we we really worked with, with the administration of these institutions, which in and of itself is a kind of knowledge building and collaborative um, community building process to collaborate on this sort of trans institutional course that would do just that and sort of center um, black indigenous and historically marginalized means of productions as a means for to introduce not only introduce students to those 
to that material, but also to reorient the canon, reorient our design methods and the kind of subjectiv subjectivities implied with sort of prevailing modes of design pedagogy. Yeah, we're putting on the table, you know, the, the teaching of this content sort of almost demands a questioning, right, of the space of the knowledge production uh, and then kind of critiquing both the content and the container uh, of the institution uh, in order to help to recenter the canon and the performance of the performance of school. Um, so next. Um, so yeah, the class was set up in, uh, into these seven uh, modules, each had a theme um, and, and, a, and a sort of uh, making exercise. Uh, we'll just kind of uh, try to speak uh, a little bit to a few of these. Uh, we, we, we um, I think we, we sort of approached this course as an opportunity and, and as, as an experiment, as a case study to uh, of course, trouble the canon that has traditionally been prioritized in architecture, namely that of the orthogonal Swiss grid. Um, and so we sort of figured that we could begin to do that by being more critical of the canon as it stands and being more imaginative with our disciplinary references and design and visual and cultural histories to trouble these sort of prevailing understandings of architecture. Um, so this first module uh, looked at the G's bin quilts and the quilters um, and the discussions and assignments sort of situated this kind of needlework as a black feminist uh, place taking and, and rhetorical practice. Um, the, the, you can go to the next slide. Uh, Christine and Kyle and Joshua and Jenna made these album covers uh, from found digital material um, and presented them as collages kind of based on these collective, uh, collectively developed grid systems. Um, okay, great. And, um, and so the, ne the next module of the course, um, uh, which really every single one of these exercises, we were trying to pair the students in different ways. So pairing Howard and Yale students, pairing also students of different age who were in the course and different academic pursuit and, and design discipline. So this module um, around language, identity and visual culture was really kind of interrogating graphic design as this kind of white dominated field, but also this enigmatic space between language and rhetoric that BIPOC bodies really you utilize and sort of improvise to create forms of communication within. So this idea of this unruly zine, uh, uh, the students really deconstructed a kind of typeface into this rhetorical expressive medium. Next. And there's an image of some of those unruly zines. Next. Uh, yes, this, this module is called the Slang Walk. Um, you know, this course actually was going on at the same time as uh, the studio with Jalisa for with. Uh, so many of the ideas and, and findings from that studio were sort of fresh in, my, in our minds. And, and I think it sort of speaks to the a feedback loop that gets created from this growing web of, of, of courses ultimately forming this sort of larger ecosystem. Uh, this module was, was more so about, was also kind of touching on uh, embodied performance um, and, and, and the spatial sort of implications and rhetorical practices that kind of uh, can be derived from that. Um, if you can go to the next slide. Um, oh yeah, thank you. So, so the, in the second part of the class, we really transitioned from um, some of these more abstract uh, concepts into a, a, an examination of sort of fugitivity more literally as a condition and a kind of set of histories and spatial practices uh, and intelligences developed around uh, fugitivity and liberation. Next. Uh, so students began to kind of dig into maybe more kind of architecture and urbanism um, proper uh, and, and thinking about kind of encoding uh, and, and um, sort of states of marronage, for example, in this exercise. Next. Curry, you want to talk about this one? Sorry. Uh, the module, so this module looked at uh, petite marronage uh, and, and fugitive modes of refusal and escape. Uh, from slavery as a means of survival and resistance. Um, this module represented a, a bit of a shift from the sort of more aesthetic production and started to consider how these different strategies uh, begin to play out in marginal and public spaces. Um, and if you can go to the next slide. Uh, so these, we, we had groups look, uh, you know, sort of use their tags from the previous exercise to envision spatial strategies of refuge. In this example, Chinedu, Joshua, and Daoud uh, took inspiration from the NAP ministry to come up with a signage system uh, made to look like official Yale signage. Uh, to reclaim certain spaces in the library as places to rest and nap. So, you know, while it maybe seems, a, a, you know, a, a bit humorous, it does sort of question what it means for bodies, especially black and brown bodies, to rest uh, in spite of uh, sort of 
production oriented regime uh, and, and then the right of those bodies to occupy space. Yeah, and so we, we, we then came full circle um, at the end of the class because of this kind of overlap of logistical schedules, which we decided to use as an opportunity for kind of pedagogical invention and brought it full circle with another unit on weaving uh, where we had Amanda Williams join us um, and engage us with her practice. Next. And the students sort of began to kind of uh, show us almost full scale weaving um, architectural projects that they had begun to do offsite, uh, kind of in this space of COVID. Next. Uh, and, so, you know, I, oh, go ahead, Curry. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, I think uh, the, the, the format of this class, I think, really enabled this sort of living free syllabus model and really, I think, troubled the format of the class, which we had a lot of fun with. Uh, we were exploring like such a wide range of these strategies and methods, uh, which was really eye-opening, I think, for all parties involved. Uh, but most importantly, it was really powerful to see how excitable the students were uh, and to start to see them sort of devise their own strategies for participating in the class. Uh, so this is actually Jonathan Sally, a Howard student, uh, aka Ice Water Artistry, who after almost every class would deliver this, this rich, amazing sort of rap performance. Uh, and he would write lyrics themed around the assignments explored in class, which is completely unsolicited. Um, so I, I just um, I just think that was it's such a such a great way of, of sort of troubling I think this, the format of, of school. Yeah, and really, you know, I think all of those things that uh, that kind of trickling in from DMU really work to produce a, a completely different academic environment. Uh, and again, also just considering blackness and indigeneity as a matter of course, when we begin to think about design, either radical and sort of more mundane tasks. Um, uh, so that that's a uh, future to practice. Excellent. Thank you so much. I'm going to just talk very briefly about the last type of course that we offer. These are DMU roster affiliated courses. Um, that is courses taught by fac faculty within the DMU collective at their home institutions and that meet the requirements of DMU's mission. So we have a list of these courses. If you go to the next slide, um, the DMU members uh, nominate or um, share these courses with us um, and we review them and we have an opportunity for some mentoring and some development. Um, and these courses are all courses that are taught as part of a standard curriculum, but that are beginning to bring DMU's mission um, deeper into that, that sort of curricular space. So these are the courses that were offered in the fall. And uh, next slide, a number of courses offered in the spring. Um, next slide, um, I'm just gonna talk really briefly about one of these courses. Um, this is architecture, um, 4850, gender, race, queer, and disability methods in architectural design. This course is integrated, fully integrated with the studio. So the idea is to probe architectural practice through gender, race, and queer theory to explore how architecture can serve as an instrument of discrimination and the naturalization of normative values. Uh, we use the critiques of disability studies and indigeneity to show the complicity of the built environment in creating disadvantaged communities. Um, a range of research methods are taught in this course, including critical analysis of representation, lobbying and political engagement. And you can see here a fact sheet that one of our students produced in order to lobby the Utah legislature on a bill that was, um, that was in session while we were teaching this class. Um, we also use decolonizing cultural geography and deep mapping. Um, sorry, go ahead, go ahead to the next slide. Um, and you can see one of those deep maps here looking at a particular area of Salt Lake City. We asked students to really dive into that, um, that geography and learn uh, how power, culture, and identity are operating in that space. Um, and you can see one of those maps here. Um, following that cultural geography, students use those maps and use that information to uh, choose and design a program. Uh, we also look at programming itself as an opportunity for cultural transformation. Um, we understand programs to be um, embedded in particular social and historical contexts, and they tend to reinforce values of a particular time and space. So we ask students to, to create their own programs so they don't have easy references and to use those programs specifically to support particular cultural, um, um, cultural identities, uh, to disrupt power structures, and to sort of re-envision community in this particular space. And if you go to the next slide, um, the final uh, uh, research method that we teach is um, looking at literary critical analysis. 
students are um, asked to choose a post-colonial uh, work of literature and analyze that, specifically looking for information about understanding the experience perspective and spatial imaginary of a culture other than their own and begin to use that understanding as a tool in the final design. Um, so all of the ideas that we, we take, um, we disrupt the division the between history theory and studio, and we use those history theory classes to transform the studios into something that moves beyond um, a technocratic image of architecture or architecture that's focused on um, an objective production rather than social um, and cultural networks. Next slide. So what's next? Um, we have shown uh, a great variety of work here this evening and it's wonderful seeing in the chat also the kind of incredible audience that has gathered here to, to um, listen to all the hard work that, that we've done and our students have done um, uh, this past year. Um, and so I think, you know, really thinking about kind of what's next is um, turning it kind of outward, I guess, back to you all and really opening it up for, for questions. But um, next slide, I think, you know, really getting centered in the kind of um, why and the impact of this work uh, is kind of thinking about the vision and mission a, a little bit and how, um, you know, Dark Matter University is founded to work inside and outside of existing systems to challenge, inform, and reshape our present world toward a better future. So when we look at our mission, next slide, we're really interested in developing new forms for new futures. Um, so some of the actions I think that people can, uh, can take is kind of consider partnering and connecting with DMU. Um, there is a RFQ for fall courses that I think uh, someone hopefully will post in the chat. Um, so please check that out, you know, in terms of thinking about seminars, studios, lectures, workshops, partnerships you might want to um, engage in with DMU. Also realizing there's no one set course or one set way of doing things. I think, you know, part of uh, the strength is the kind of multitude and the variety. Um, so if you have an original idea, come at us. Um, I think another action is, is, you know, bringing new chairs to the table where you sit. And also, I think what you've seen a lot tonight is really thinking about both the form and the content of, of your work, our work, our collective work. Um, so here are just some resources in terms of, you know, how you can kind of further connect with us. Again, that link to the RFQ for fall courses. And really, I'd just like to say on behalf of the whole group, thank you so much. Um, and we'd like to open it up for, for questions if we have a little bit more time. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. So we are done with the presentation. We have a, uh, go ahead, please. I was just gonna say there is a question in the, there was a question that came up in the chat. Yes. There's already a couple of questions. I'm gonna begin with the one that Woodrow asked a little bit further up, uh, which was, will there be some discussion around how these courses were implemented, meaning how these courses were structured at each of the participating institutions and what sort of governance do you have to go through? Uh, I think I'll let Taya take this one because she's particularly well suited. Sure, uh, thanks Woodrow for asking. Um, so how we structure them, well, for the fall courses, it was mostly based on existing partnerships and connections we had. When we first launched last year, we got invites from many universities to come in and do university lecture series for the um, for the fall semester. And then our schedule got full and we started pushing things on our dance card to the spring. Um, but it allowed us to enter into some specific conversations with universities that had interest in more to start lining up things for the fall. I mean, for the spring, I think also a lot of the courses that we started in the spring were related to places where we had DMU members that were already deep in the kind of administration or decision making, which we found was really key and critical was having BIPOC folks that we had connections to that were in critical decision making decisions. So I do wanna take this moment to shout out 
um, Joyce, Andrew, and Lisa, um, who are all here, I think tonight, because they were really instrumental in like understanding, seeing the vision and trusting us to come in. Um, and it was great because we had them at the table. They were able to help us, you know, shape things and, and uh, figure out what's the best way to line things up. I think now uh, we are trying to do this through this RFQ process to sort of streamline things. Uh, we spent a lot of time and energy last year trying to kind of vet and negotiate with universities. And everybody here has at least one full-time job. Many people have more than one full-time job. <laughs> and so uh, our hope is that through this uh, single entry door for the RFQ that we can kind of outlay what we need and then universities can respond to that. And then from there, we can go in and just start knocking down partnerships. Uh, I think we talked earlier in the call about some of the kind of rules that we set up. So we are looking at institutions. We are looking at places where they're already doing some of this work. You know, we, we love to go in and a foundation's already been set and there's already an approach to anti-racism and there's already an approach to thinking critically about diversity and inclusion and equity. Um, and places that are willing to experiment because that's where you know we get to have the most fun. Uh, we are trying to partner these institutions, right? So for every, you know, we're calling them more resource, historically resourced and, and less resourced institutions. We are looking for partners in both space that we can bring those two schools together. Um, and then we've also been reaching out and kind of going in a one-off, uh, you know, uh, grant applications with very specific institutions around very specific opportunities that come up as well. So it kind of runs the gamut. I hope that answers. Yeah, now I'll just add in to say uh, one thing, which is that it requires a lot of flexibility, uh, especially because we are actively working to not have a single person with a traditional set of credentials and criteria who's overvalued, frankly, to teach courses in a rigid structure within an institution. That is not what any of this is about. Uh, and so it does require flexibility to sort of find ways to uh, encourage collaborative teaching, to encourage uh, more flexible schedules and flexible formats. Uh, absolutely, uh, Zoom and online teaching and format, frankly, has allowed a lot of this to happen. Uh, as we move forward, we know a lot of institutions are going to be revisiting that. and so. Being uh, sort of flexible and creating new hybrid approaches and models will, will be quite important just on a purely logistical level. And then that even gets into things like who's credential to teach a course and, and who can get paid and how and all that, that that also needs some flexibility. So I know it's not the, the whole part, but it's an important part. No, and, and I think just to follow up on what Justin, the peership model is incredibly important for, for DMU, meaning that, uh, you know, uh, partnering folks that have experience teaching with people that may be starting or have a little bit of less uh, and creating true uh, equal partnerships in that space that also requires sometimes the institutions to understand that. Uh, I know, uh, uh, Jati, you were in stack and then I'm gonna put uh, Gustavo's question to whomever wants to answer. Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to just say one thing. I know that a lot of us here, uh, thank you, shout out to everyone who's stuck this long, like it's 159 looking at the participants. Uh, but one thing I want to echo, which again, is completely different from who I am, right? I'm fresh blood, really young, but um, Taya, someone who's revered, you know, Jerome, Killian, everyone else has a different level of experience. But what I want to stress on is that your students, students in this fall, or anyone else who is feeling like they don't really belong in academia. Like I didn't, I didn't honestly think I belong here, but as far as governance goes, like being mad, not problematic, but like loud is the space that we, we've encouraged this space. So um, as far as governance of like what courses are taught, um, it's a half, half, right? It's from those who have been teaching for a while and those like myself who are just entering into the field. So I want to stress that out because we're not trying to be uh, perpetuating the old guard, right? I don't care if you're colored or white. Old is old. And so I'm, I'm glad that we have the space and that you've taken my um, thoughts into consideration. So. Yeah, and, and we do meet regularly. There's sort of a collective governance that we, we sort of meet reg, uh, regularly and, and discuss courses, even things like lectures, how we engage uh, with people. And that that's all done by the 
kind of the hive, for lack of a better term. Um, can I mention a question? Which one was it? Is Gustavo on whether we have considered me, uh, putting out free and online content and what that means? I know that in some back channels we talk about potentially ways to fund that. Uh, we we are uh, we are very 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 conscious of of making sure that uh, that that we don't work for free <laughs> and that the, this labor is uh, fairly compensated. We believe that that is the way all pedagogical uh, work should be compensated, but specifically this kind of work. Uh, but anyone else, uh, anyone, I'll put it on the table. I mean, I'll, I'll start with that just to say that uh, some of our content is uh, available online on various channels. So uh, we have our own channel where we've put some content, uh, YouTube and, and social media will um, continue that. Uh, in many of our conversations and negotiations with schools for things like lectures, there, there are explicit conversations about ensuring that that content is available uh, online as well. Uh, when it comes to spaces of, in, of instruction, it gets a little tricky uh, uh, because you do need to, in, in many cases, have safe spaces uh, uh, and, and the ability for people to, to feel comfortable. And so we don't necessarily sort of put everything uh, out there. Uh, but it is something that we'll be looking at uh, certainly going forward, you know, how we can both pay for our, our time and labor and, and energy, but, but also create platforms that uh, provide access for, for people who don't have it. One thing I, I will mention is that we have uh, uh, course content that's not for people in the university environment. Uh, so we're working with uh, Van Allen Institute to do uh, uh, sort of design justice focused coursework uh, over the summer and fall that's working with community members uh, in a neighborhood in Brooklyn that's kind of undergoing some significant change. So we are being very conscious about broadening the audience, but we, we just have to figure out the right kind of mechanics and platform for that work. Also to piggyback off what Justin said, whenever we do do university public lectures, we make sure that we always share them on our media feeds as well. So that if we're, you know, we spoke at CCA, we spoke at IIT this year, it is something that anyone else that's following us on Instagram would be able to follow. We did the same for this event tonight. Um, and it's something we've discussed internally is making sure that in the future we write into our agreements for future lectures that we're able to kind of co-share and own the rights to the video so that we can keep sharing them publicly. Um, Killian, you want me to jump to the next question in the chat? Cause it's sort of- Please tie it. Okay, so the next question is from Evan and it says, were non-design students allowed to take the DMU courses to fulfill as general education requirements at any of the institutions? Um, and that's a great question, Evan. Um, most of the classes were hosted in the design schools. Um, and so we know there are complications. Design schools get complicated, which we all know. I can say my class, which is a DMU uh, roster course is actually cross-listed at Temple University as a gen ed class. And so the majority of my class is actually non-architects um, and it's pretty closely mapped to the foundations of design justice course. It is something that we are really hoping to push for more of in the future, um, but you know, so getting non-designers um, into studio courses is hard. Working across departments is hard, especially when you've added in partner and paired institutions and in different um, different year levels. But it's something that we are always actively uh, seeking and really working hard to make sure that we can incorporate it as much as we can. I, I will say also at the University of Utah, um, my gender, race, and queer theories and architecture course was cross-listed. And uh, we had some issues with um, sort of cross vulnerability when gender studies students came into that space and started speaking in their language and architecture students were speaking in their language and it, it created real hostility and conflict. So what I have done is I mirror my course. So I do teach it primarily, I teach it to architects um, when it fits into the architecture curriculum, but I also have a version of it that I offer to gender studies, to the gender studies program. So I teach in both programs. But I do think that, that that one of the things that becomes really clear is that when you're teaching an architecture course with an architecture cohort where everybody's been in the same courses together for years, and then you introduce new students into that space, the, the potential for hostility can be pretty high, especially when you're talking about these kinds of sensitive issues. So I, I do think that um, further experimentation with that is really critical, but really thinking about the different experiences of the students and the different sort of cultures of language and speech that come from those different programs is really an important part of making that successful. 
If I may, but this is a little different than what you asked, but I wanted to share one small thing, which is that we brought 17 year olds to give critiques to the graduate students because they have been doing the work. They, they, they're they part of the 12, uh, 12, uh, liter uh, uh, 12 literary program and their youth council doing urban planning and urban design under a writer and editor. And, and they've been doing the work. The like, city of Cleveland is looking to them. So we brought them, gave, they gave a lecture and then we had an, an all the conversation. They were fascinated by our process and the way of working and they added so much value. So this is a little bit different, but I think expanding the classroom is something that we're very interested in. And, and Van Allen might change that too. Am I correct? Someone that might know more about the Van Allen program might be able to chime in, maybe Vanessa or, or uh, Cellini or someone, I don't know. Um, yeah, so the Van Allen program, um, they're doing a neighborhood design fellowship, and it's been very interesting to sort of see how it's progressed, um, but we'll be doing six weeks um, specifically of their program, which which I think starts actually next week, um, but we'll be doing six weeks in the summer, AL and um, and Nooper will be um, leading it, and we'll be bringing in um, guest speakers along the way, and there will be a public event which I think is going to be really great because the community fellows will have a capstone that we'll be working with them on and it will be presented to the public. I think it's in October, Al. Do you, do you have the date? Yeah, it's, I think it's like October 2nd, like very early October, but we'll be posting all about it. So you'll know. <laughs> I also, there was a question in the chat about how students can engage with DMU if they are not, um, you know, if their schools may not be involved. And we are actively trying to sort of think about ways of, of ha making that happen. We have a campus group um, uh, that, that is sort of exploring what, you know, how to connect with DMU in a virtual way. Um, I think right now, the best way is to follow us on social media. Over the summer, there will probably be a series of, you know, IG lives happening. And so that is one way to engage. Um, but we are actively exploring that. So, so stay tuned for that. Yeah, other folks, I, I know Sikra, and I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Uh, I, I don't know if you even want to turn on your, your camera and ask your question, I, but I feel like we all kind of jumped at it in the chat, but if there's more conversation around that, I would love to have it. Hello. Um, hi, yes, you pronounced my name correctly. Hi, everyone, I'm Zikra. I'm currently a student at U of T. Um, I actually uh, was introduced to Dark Matter University by Professor Justin Garrett Moore. Um, you came to our class um, for ARC 302 and yeah, but the, the problem that, um, well, it all started last year, right? During summer and everything. And we have been working with professors um, to decolonize their curriculum and some have been receptive but at the same time, there's a lot of always going to take time. And we understand that we've been trying to help them with their research and everything. But at the same time, it, it, it just feels even weird that we student even have to ask for diversity at this point because we're well past beyond a point where it's only white people who can attend universities. We have a diverse, um, community at our university and everything. So right now I'm a bit worried that I'm gonna graduate next year and um, nothing is going to change because uh, right now <laughs> we don't even have an equity and diversity committee at my university. <laughs> we, it, yeah, it's, it's a weird thing that's happening. But yeah, and that's just one of my worries that this is going to um, end with my um, class graduating. We've been trying to get other people to join in, but they it, it seems like they're a bit scared of uh, um, what it will ent entail, uh, as in they don't want to have a bad relationship with professor or faculty or have their um, future disrupted in any kind of way because of their advocacy for this. Yeah, that, that's that's just one of the worries that I, <laughs> it's great. Yeah, 
So. Thanks so much for sharing and being so open, Secret. Really appreciate it. And, you know, count on us. <laughs> Uh, join. Uh, we we have weekend meetings. Uh, Design us protests. Also, we'll be more than happy to work with you on some of these questions in and out of institutions. Uh, I know Al. Uh, maybe Al, you had something that you wanted to say. Maybe. No, I don't. I think Jerome is in the stack. Jerome. Oh, Jerome. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. I. Um, yeah. Thanks, Zikra. I, I just wanted to echo some of the statements, but also, you know, echo yet yeah, one. Yes, please be in touch with organizations like us. Um, as an alumni, you have a lot of agency. Uh, I think alumni of schools can put pressure on institutions from a different vantage point. Uh, and you, you know, encourage the younger students to kind of work across um, age groups or um, year level to, um, you know, be outspoken, be public about your, your demands and your wishes for the school. Yeah, so, no, I, I was gonna say, I'll just add that um, part of the reason that all of us ended up doing, like Bobby spent so much time on DMU is that we have for generations had the exact same experience that you've had. Um, and, and this is a really big, complex, difficult, and, and sort of daunting challenge. But the reason that we're, we're doing all this and why we're doing it together is because we know it's, it's important that we, we do something, right? Um, and I know when you're up against an institution, it's just really challenging and demoralizing and everything else. But uh, we have, through DMU, been able to kind of create and find a space that we can you know, try to change uh, some of these things and where we can't to frankly just build our own. Uh, and, and, you know, while we're working with institutions and, and doing some of that work, we're, we're equally uh, and actively uh, building some of our own uh, spaces and uh, new forms of, of collective and knowledge and power and all of that, so. Just wanted to say that, so definitely uh, join us and tell others that I'm sure you know uh, that that uh, they can do the same. Yeah, and I'll I'll just add um, thank you again, Sikra, for bringing that up because um, you're bringing up like the actual the real next steps of like what what is DMU's future and what are we actually trying to achieve here. I see a little bit of that in the chat too, and I think we're we're trying to keep in the spirit of like we're we're co-creating this as it's happening. And we're working collectively to try to um, go toward a vision that that makes sense for all of us. Um, and so joining in on the effort is like is the best way to join. But it's like um, the work that you're doing and the experiences that you're having and and you're you're speaking up is also doing the work too. So thank you. So um, I, I you know. I've been asked to try to try to end it as close to as possible to 7:30. I very much appreciate the, the conversation and the work. Um, there's a great question about studio process that I think uh, maybe we, if if you don't mind, if we could talk about that uh, so, uh, uh, offline, or maybe we can end with that. But but I, this does mean that we hope to have another conversation like this. Maybe next time a little bit longer. Maybe it sounds like folks are both interested. Big picture. Uh, and and Secret, one of the things that, that I think is a constant, none of these things have answers yet. We're building them together. Uh, so big picture, but also the minutia, how to both from the contractual, and uh, which is incredibly important. I think all of us that are interested in these sets of issues understand that the pragmatics make things happen or don't. Uh, and, uh, uh, but as well as how then, how does the classroom change? How does uh, competition? Those are incredibly important and big questions. Uh, I, I, we can share that we've been trying to do as collective a work as possible and bring the very organizing model that we're co-creating to the classroom and share it with the students, which also uh, takes a little bit of thinking about your power dynamic as a professor uh, with your students and breaking that down. Uh, but I, and I'll leave if there are any last thoughts, anything that the folks want to talk about or say. Uh, section nine, that's all I got to say to any student who's here. Section nine and NAB, no one has ever done it. I have confirmation from the executive director. Invoke section nine, question your school's accountability or credibility for that matter. So, I also just wanted to say something that we didn't touch on here is that the people group has been actively looking at mentorship 
um, as, as sort of a core tenant of, of what we need to do amongst sort of ourselves. And so there's sort of ladder mentorship um, with, with people more senior, but also people just entering the profession. And so we've had sort of skill shares and office hours to talk about different things, either getting into institutions or looking at tenure applications or, you know, applying for grants. So there's been this internal um, relationship building that has really helped um, make this happen that that isn't that was not presented today, but it's been pretty amazing. Any other final thoughts that anyone has? If not, we just thank you. We thank you for being here. We hope that you join us in whatever way you can and uh, we, we're going to continue the work and uh, the work continues. So thank you.